Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome all of you to the candidate forum for the 57th Assembly District. We are pleased to have you here in the studio audience and to have people listening at home on their local cable. We have just concluded a forum for the 32nd Senate District, which you will be able to watch on local cable or on YouTube in the next few weeks before the election. Tonight, the League of Women Voters of Whittier is sponsoring this candidate forum. The League is a nonpartisan organization that, as one of its main arms, does voter service outreach to its communities. Voter service includes candidate forums such as this, and which you, the voter, can come, ask questions, listen, and talk with the candidates who are seeking to represent you as an assembly person in Sacramento. We have invited all the candidates who are running in the 57th Assembly District. We sent each of them um, a hard copy invitation with instructions. We sent each of them an email invitation. And in most cases, they were also phoned phone to <clears throat> make sure that they knew about the forum and to try to uh, solicit their cooperation. There are five people running in this race. And as you see, three have come this evening to share their views with you. I have a regret from um, our current state assemblyman, uh, Ian Calderon, that I will read to you. Thank you for inviting Assembly Member Calderon to the <clears throat> May 14th Candidates Forum. Unfortunately, because it's a Monday and the legislature is in session, he will not be able to attend. He sends his deepest regrets and this statement for you to use. Please accept my regrets that I cannot participate in the May 14th forum. The legislature is in session that day and I will be at the Capitol participating in floor session, legislative hearings, and scheduled meetings. Thank you for all you do to organize this important public discourse. From Ian Calderon. The candidates were uh, given these instructions, which they all agreed to uh, abide by during the evening. First, presentations by the candidates and questions from the audience must be confined to matters involving state government and government policy, not personalities. Personal attacks will not be tolerated. Only written questions may be accepted from the audience, and our question sorters will be reviewing the questions for civility, for clarity, and for a variety of topics relevant to state government. Biographical material from each of the candidates is available outside as well as voter registration forms if you need to change your address or your name or your political party affiliation. There are forms available outside which you can fill in and mail yourself. Uh, the last date for registering to vote is a week from tonight, I think. Monday the 21st. So uh, we appreciate having all of you here. And the candidates have drawn for order of speaking. They will be, uh, they are seated in the order in, uh, that they drew. We will hear from them with opening statements of two minutes. Then we will have panel questions. Then we will have audience questions. And we will conclude with a one minute closing statement and that um, will be in reverse order. So our first candidate this evening is Jessica Martinez. Thank you. Good evening, uh, City of Whittier. I'm so glad to be here tonight, and I would uh, like to thank the League of Women Voters. Thank you for taking time out of your lives to present this forum to our voters and our community. Uh, these types of things are so very, very important. Uh, we need to be inform an informed electorate. In any case, my name is Jessica Martinez, and I am running for California State Assembly. Um, I do not belong to any political machine. I have no uh, vested interests in any um, outside organizations. 
my interests are the voters of this district, and I will put you first before everything. We need to set uh, our California legislature straight. They are taxing us to death, and they don't seem to care about the average working person. Um, I am the wife of a veteran. I am the daughter of a veteran, and so I know a little bit about discipline. I have five grown children, and um, I went back to law school after raising my children. Uh, my children are, one of them is entering college this year, and my other, I have two business people um, that are in the family as well. In any case, um, I have a degree, I just uh, finished an, a degree in international human rights law as well at Trinity Law School. And I also have a degree in political science. So I would like to thank all of you for your time this evening. I hope it will be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we would like to hear from Blake Sullivan Carter. Hello. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'd like to thank the League of Women's Voters. Um, it's pretty awesome that you're doing this as a third party, um, as opposed to you know just the Democrats and Republicans mediating. Um, also, uh, so you know, my name is Blake. I've been a student of life. Everything I know, I've attributed to the people that have come before me, and I'm incredibly humbled by even sitting up here. It's a pretty cool experience. So. Um, you know, uh, I'm doing this because I want to take money out of politics and I want to provide health care for all Californians. I think it's an absurd notion that as the um, richest nation on the planet Earth ever in the history of our species, we can't provide health care for the people in this state. Um, yeah, it's an absurd notion. And we need to be able to provide these services for our citizens. Uh, we need to be able to bargain for pharmaceutical drugs. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to do, especially, you know, reducing the burden on taxpayers, especially the middle class, but it's going to be incredibly difficult when our politicians are so bought. So what we're trying to do um, is, uh, well, what I'm trying to do more specifically, if elected, is um, my promise to everyone in this room is that I don't listen to lobbyists, I don't listen to big business, and I don't take any money from special interest. I knock doors, I bring people in the community together, I've already knocked several thousand doors in the district. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that um, it's been an incredibly humbling experience, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. And finally, we will hear from Justin Joshua Valero. Thank you. Hello, my name is Professor Justin Valero. Uh, I teach over at Cal State San Bernardino, and I was born here and raised here in Whittier, California. I live actually right off of Greenleaf. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum, and I'd also like to thank my uh, fellow candidates as well. I know how difficult this has been for the past year, so I can imagine what it's been like for you. And thank you, everybody, for staying. Uh, apparently, uh, the main event was the last one, so you're staying for the undercard. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, so the thing is, I want to change the way that California does politics because California right now, our state legislature, tends to have a priority of these lofty goals about bullet trains and large-scale uh, infrastructure programs. But the problem is, is that we haven't gotten back down to basics. The thing is, is that as we pat ourselves on the back, we have a housing crisis that is going to push out tens of thousands of people for being priced out of the market. We have a health care uh, crisis where people are paying for more uh, or people paying more while getting less coverage. We have college students who are trying to do their best, doing everything they're supposed to be told, do, doing everything they're supposed to, yet they're seeing themselves be in financial ruin by the time that they actually graduate. And we have a criminal justice system that has been in this uh, experiment with Prop 4757 and AB 109 that has not worked and Whittier is the epicenter of this experiment and we're not going to handle it and we're not going to stand for it anymore. And so we need to make major investments in housing. We need to make sure that we're protecting those who are on Medi-Cal, for instance. 30 to 40 percent of the people inside of this district are on Medi-Cal, yet PIH can't see a single one of them. That is an ill to our society, to our district. And we need to have kids who have Head Start and the ability for pre-K. We need to make sure that our criminal justice system has that kind of balance, that has the type of reforms that it needs, because otherwise those investments are not going to happen. It's going to hurt us over the, over the long term. Thank you. 
Now, we'll have uh, questions addressed by our panel. And the first question will come from Barbara Guile of uh, American Association of University Women. Thank you. Currently, there isn't enough money in the public retirement system to pay for all the benefits promised to government workers. What would you do as an assembly member to address the unfunded pension liability? <clears throat> I and think that... Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll, <laughs> we'll start with Ms. Martinez. Go the same order this time, and then we'll choose a new person for the second question. I think that that's an extremely important question. Um, I believe that one of the things that we have to do is take a step back and learn from private industry. What does private industry do when they do not have enough money to take care of a problem? What they do is they make cutbacks. Uh, what they do is they renegotiate uh, contracts with unions. Sometimes um, they renegotiate with the employees themselves. I, and so I believe that what we have to do, and I'm not, by, by any stretch of the imagination, I am not anti-union. I do believe that there, uh, there's a healthy balance uh, that, that needs to be there. However, I do believe that we have to make those cutbacks when they are necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Can you say the last part of the question again? Certainly. <clears throat> I'll say the whole question. Thank you. <laughs> Currently, there isn't enough money in the public retirement system to pay for all the benefits promised to the government workers. What would you do as an assembly member to address the unfinished, the unfunded pension liability? Well, first off, this is an incredibly complex issue. Um, but what I would do is I would reduce government waste in a lot of different departments so we could reallocate the funds to workers so they can get the money that they were promised in the first place. Um, right now we have 200,000 people incarcerated in the state of California. Um, it costs on average anywhere from 60 to $73,000 a year for each individual. Um, what I would do is I would propose a change to the private bail bond system more in particular, um, because right now, currently as it stands, we don't have a federal system in the state of California. So if you're convicted of a low level crime, the majority of the time you will go to jail, you can't bail yourself out, or you're gonna put your uh, family in financial hardship to get you out in the first place, you're gonna lose housing, things like that. And that's why the recidivism rate is so high in this state, it's over 70%, I believe. So there's a lot of government waste, and as they say, uh, government waste is always keeping somebody in the black. So. As far as our retirement is concerned, retirement pensions, if the money isn't there, I think we can find it elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Valero. This affects me personally because I'm under CalPERS. <laughs> uh, so, and I'm gonna be frank about this. We overpromised and underdelivered. Yes. So what we're go what's going on right now is that we need to be able to open up all avenues because when it comes, when I came into the CalPERS system, I was already on a new rate. I was on a new way of pension. It was not the same as my colleagues who came in in 1965. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that that is the reality. And what, as those pensions change, what that's saying is, we are realizing that this is an unsustainable model. We cannot continue this with, we cannot continue this model of pensions and just think that we're just gonna pop money out. And this is an unrealistic way of thinking about it. Yes, we need revenue changes, and yes, we need all different types of ideas in order to change with the budget, but the fact of the matter is until you get that legislation passed, you don't have any other money. And so the issue that we need to do is we have to be able to open up to renegotiate as much as I was the one, I was standing there marching on the fight for five to get our money, to make sure that we could get that raise back from, for just our wages. But the thing is, this is unsustainable. We overpromised, we underdelivered, and we need to be able to make a real assessment of how we're going to pay for this, and if not, we need to renegotiate it. Thank you. Now we will hear a second question from Beverly Walker of the League. Climate changes and the shifting between very wet weather and drought worry Californians. What strategies would allow your district to both satisfy its water needs and protect the environment? Please be specific. 
We'll begin with Mr. Carter, go to Mr. Valero, and end with Ms. Martinez. Right now, a majority of our precipitation comes from the tropics. Um, I'm going to give you a brief history mm -hmm. lesson on how California gets its water. The water comes from the tropics, and it's deposited to a majority of it in the California north, which is this high Sierras. Um, what we've done over the last 80 years is we've created a massive infrastructure to take that water and reallocate it, redistribute it, as you will, into the Central Valley. Um, what we've done with the Central Valley is we have overstretched ourselves vastly, and these billionaires who are growing these cash crops, such as 99% of all of the nation's pistachios, 99% of all of the nation's almonds, they have free reign to do whatever they want because they have navigated the backroom politics of Sacramento and of Washington. So what I would like to do is revisit that and uh, hold these people's feet to the fire. And um, I know that in particular right now, especially with the cash crops, we need to reconsider maybe growing something else because three times the amount of water that is used to water or that is used in every single household in Los Angeles County and in San Francisco combined is used to water those crops yearly. It's an unsustainable system and it needs to change. Thank you. Mr. Valero. There's a multitude of things that we need to talk about. First is education. The first thing that we need to do is people have, there's a, UC, uh, there's a University of Riverside, UC Riverside study that actually looked at who, when you ask someone how much water you think they spent, how much water they think they use, they actually use four, point, four to five times what they report that they use. The city of Melbourne, Australia, when they were facing a drought, actually was able to put up electronic signs showing how much water was left, and it actually increased water conservation because people were very frank with what they needed. The second thing that we need to do is actually put in we need to put in more investment into ground reservoirs. Groundwater reservoirs are, they're not as sexy and as nice as putting up these big reservoirs a politician can stand up in front of, but the thing is is that they actually help our system. And they actually can allow for more groundwater and more rainwater to not go into the ocean because that's one of the biggest issues. And lastly, the issue that we need to is also about rate adjustments. We need to sustainable rate pricing within our water boards that actually calculates how much people are using. And if you're using the required amount, well, then you pay the minimum amount. And it helps with conservation because that's what you're paying. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Well, this issue I think is of extreme important to, importance to all Californians. And I believe that we're focusing not so much on, uh, we do have uh, climate issues probably. Um, some will, will say we're entering into a, a new ice age and some will say we have global warming. So in any case, looking at the facts, the facts are that we have mismanaged the water, the rain uh, that we have received, 87% of the water was allowed to just flow back into the ocean. But yet, they're telling the average person, you have to pay higher prices for your water, you have to cut back on, on your usage, and, and why? Because Sacramento mismanaged. We need to uh, build desalination plants. Let's take a look at Israel and see what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Point, point, of, point of personal privilege, I, I, with all due respect for the League of Women Voters, a minute's not good enough to talk about this. So if you're interested in asking us more questions, I'd be more than happy to do so. If, uh, if my other colleagues would be open to as well. Be there is no water if there's no California. There's no California if there's no water. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on now to some questions that have been submitted from the audience. Yay. And um, we'll start with one that, <coughs> let's see, first here. Um, what do you think are the three most important problems that the California legislature needs to address in legislation during the next two years? when planning for California's long-term needs. And we'll begin with Mr. Valero, go to Ms. Martinez, and end with Mr. Carter. Well, that would be housing, criminal justice, and uh, school funding. The way that that would work is criminal justice, 4757 and AB 109 have failed this community. And all you need to do is go off of the corner of Kalima and Mar Vista, and we all know why. So the issue is that, we need to have a criminal justice system that 
is able to keep violent criminals from coming out. But the other issue that we have is that we we don't keep people from coming in. Prop 47 had mandatory, had drug court uh, in state uh, funding, but we never made it mandatory. So people can go in, go to drug court, but then just get the six months. So why don't we make that mandatory? The other thing that we need to do is make sure that when it comes to uh, criminals who are inside of or people who are inmates, we have no transitional programs. Uh, the other thing that we need to do, education, that make the fact is Cal Grants are just, uh, are not pegged to inflation. And the fact of the matter is when it comes to housing, we need to be able to make incentives for low income housing and middle income housing because the new face of middle income housing and low income housing are 20 year olds who are getting out of school. And the other issue with that is no one on this dais or beforehand has talked about Section 8 housing. And it, if you, we have right. the vouchers, so, but the problem is, is no income housing is no good if you, no one's being able to use the vouchers. So we need incentives for that for landlords. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Well, I happen to believe that some of our greatest issues have to be looked at from a broader perspective. We need to back up and take a look at what our real priorities should be. Mine are faith, protecting your faith, your family, your freedom. Those are the most important things that I believe we should be focusing in on here in California. Um, in regards to our freedom, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but there have been several bills that have uh, been introduced in the assembly that were aimed at destroying uh, homeschooling here in the state of California. I believe it was 2756. Um, and there's another one, Bill 2943, which is aimed at restricting the freedom of counselors and Christian uh, advocacy and, and help to people who are having trouble with their sexual identity. Thank you. Thank you. My top three are going to be uh, housing, um, bail bond system, so the incarceration system, and, um, wow, this is going to be quick, and increased funding for schools, obviously. All right, so housing. In California, we have 3.5, uh, we need 3.5 million units built in the next 10 years. Right now, we are building about 100,000 a year. That means we're behind every, about 335,000 housing units a year. Um, commercial lots are vastly underutilized in Los Angeles County. Um, we have an essential retail apocalypse upon us. So I would say that we should reallocate and we should make sure that there's 100% residential um, zoning in commercial zones so we can redevelop all of that land. And also uh, right now it takes on average of three to five years to build in this state. So I would uh, make sure that if you can actually get something approved, you can start doing it right away because these builders are, they have carrying costs. It's very expensive. So essentially our legislators have said, uh, leave the state and don't build here. Second, uh, reforming the bail bond system to reduce the incarceration rate and the recidivism rate. Um, and second, we need to obviously fund our schools because our students are our future. Um, these are people that, or their children, they don't really have a say in the matter. And um, they need to be provided for and uh, we need to do the best we can for them. First and foremost, if we fail there, we fail everywhere. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> For this next question, uh, we will begin with Ms. Martinez and work our way down the row. This has to do with infrastructure and the water system in California. Do you support or oppose the proposed Delta Tunnels project for moving water from Northern California to Southern California? Please explain your answer. Um, okay, going back to our, our, our water problem here in California, truthfully, I do not know that much about the Delta Tunnel system. However, what I do know is that we, uh, we must start repairing the system that we do have and making plans and looking at other solutions, whether it's here in our own country or elsewhere. I mentioned Israel a little while ago. Uh, they have desalination plants, and that's what we should have here in California. There, there really is no reason for us to be uh, in a drought situation. And what was the other part of the question? I'm, so, I'm sorry. You talked about? Well, it was explained what your position is on the Delta Tunnels. Right. So, okay. 
right. importing water, a new way of importing water from Northern California to Southern California. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Carter. I believe that if we can't get the money out of our politics, um, none of this stuff is ever going to be fruitful for us. Um, right now, uh, on average, uh, I think it's 43% of Californians believe that the best way to conserve water is take a shorter shower. Um, I would like to incentivize. <laughs> I would like to incentivize. Um, you know, the G. H. Palmers of the world, the Goldrich Kests of the world, the people who are really at the forefront of development in the state, guys who own more than 10,000 units in Los Angeles County. I would like these people to be the front runners. And um, I'm not impractical. I know that Californians are not wealthy, and neither am I. And I know that they're more focused on cutting back as opposed to um, retrofitting property. So I would like these major developers to to lead us uh, lead the way as far as development is concerned, so we can lower costs for retrofitting property with the state of the art, um, you know, toilets, sinks, things like that that are going to actually conserve water over the long term. Um, like I said, if we don't take the money out of politics, we can't accomplish any of this because we can build this delta, and it'll cost the state billions of dollars potentially. But we could uh, do it the right way in the first place, and we could just save money in the long run by retrofitting our properties and making sure that these big developers are held accountable. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Valero. I would like to provide an answer to the question. Uh, the answer to the question, so the, the issue with the tunnels, my, my concern with those tunnels coming from the Delta, up, going through, uh, providing from the Sacramento River, we do have an issue with those pumps that do suck in salt water from the San Francisco Bay, bringing th when water naturally is supposed to go westward. However, there is a concern whether or not those dealt the, whether or not those tunnels, what kind of environmental impact they are. With California water fix and also making sure that we have the wetlands okay. um, done properly, that's going to be a major issue about whether or not we're going to properly support wetlands, whether or not we're properly going to uh, keep the um, ecological impact and also the agricultural impact because we're bringing this down from, uh, from the uh, from the Sacramento River, getting that pump through, making sure that that water then using gravity is pushing that fresh water through so we're not causing as much salt water and fish to be brought in. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's protecting the fisheries and it's protecting the uh, ecological impact and agriculture, that is something I can support. But that's only after we have guarantees that we have people, for instance, in the San Joaquin Valley that are not going to be majorly impacted by this type of water redistribution and the introduction, introduction of these tunnels. So that is my major concern about that piece of legislation, that, that bill. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, there is a bond on the ballot in June of $4.1 billion that would specifically fund water, natural resources protection, and climate adaptation projects. It has, it's about slightly over one-third for water projects, uh, slightly under one-third for parks, and about one-third for uh, various other kinds of natural resources, which include rivers and streams and uh, levees and uh, mudslide areas and that type of thing. These uh, uh, general obligation bonds have been approved for some of these projects already, and 100 million of the Prop 68 authorization is from prior bonds that the voters passed over the past 12 years or so. Why do we need to have another general obligation bond authorization at this time for these types of projects? And we'll begin with Mr. Carter, go to Mr. Valero, and end up with Ms. Martinez. I would say that, um, any money that we can fund towards these projects, I'm all for. Um, I don't know the particulars of this specific bond question, so I'm not going to answer it perfectly because I don't want to sound stupid. But, <laughs> but um, you know, I uh, I believe that funding our parks, making sure that we're funding and we're well, we're having water conservation in the state, all of these things. Like I said, I don't know the particulars of the question. So, um, but yeah, I think we should allocate as many funds as possible towards all of these projects. And that's, I can cede my time. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Valero. Oh, the answer is we don't. 
Uh, the, the issue when we put general bonds like this or we have general obligations like this is that we then hamstring the money that we're trying to use. And so the issue that we have here is that we need to be far more discretionary in our spending and in, in things that are working. Um, particularly when it comes to water conservation, the fact is that we need to develop more aqueducts. The Oroville Dam is a proof positive of why we need to make sure that we need to put more into infrastructure spending, especially in water. If that dam went, we would have major issues in terms of water shortages. And so we need to be able to make sure that we have we have a legislature for a reason, and so we need to be able to have discretionary spending towards that. And quite frankly, the, the, by adding, by putting these types of general bills, these propositions are are oftentimes pigeonholing what we're doing. Um, so, as a matter of fact, you know, money in politics sometimes does does do things. So that is going to be an issue that we have. But the answer to your first question about do we need more? No, we don't. Discretion. We need to have some more discretion in our budget, particularly right now. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. I liked your answers because what you're basically saying is let's be conservative with our money. And I think that, that whenever we are dealing with taxpayer uh, money, that we should be as conservative as possible. After all, these are the monies that are being taken out of our paychecks. Uh, they are being taken out of uh, your, your, your car tax. When you went to the DMV, I'm sure you saw an increase there. Um, just recently, I believe that uh, the legislators wanted to tax uh, our drinking water. Uh, they wanted to tax food, grocery store food, not when you go out to eat. Um, they just are consistently finding new ways to tax us. In any event, I believe that the bonds uh, that we already have allocated, I think they're, they're already there on the books. We have to go with them. But they, bonds are the most expensive way of funding something. They are extremely expensive to the taxpayer. I know it's one of those things like, oh, let's spend today, and then we'll have to pay back later. Thank you. Thank you. This question asks, how do you plan to end dark money in politics? What type of legislation will you implement to stop or prevent dark money, which corrupts our political arena? And for this question, we'll begin with Mr. Valero, go to Mr. Carter, and end with Ms. Martinez. Just a quick comment on fiscal responsibility. Last time I checked, um, being fiscally responsible does not necessarily have a D or an R next to it. Um, so the thing that we have to make, the, the thing when it comes to dark money is we have to really push at the lobbyist factor of this. Um, because we can have this discussion all day about, oh, whether or not we're going to have, you know, we should have a, a more strict way of doing campaign finance. Trust me, I fill out campaign finance things all day. I already feel like I'm in trouble. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so the thing is, is that we have to, and I don't even take it, and I have no special interest money, and I still am like, oh, <laughs> did, did I do something wrong? Um, the, the thing that we need to make sure of is that lobbyist interaction with legislators is a real issue. Uh, but the thing is, the, the realistic answer is not much is going to get done. <laughs> the, the, that's the realistic answer, is that because you're asking the legislature to police itself, and it's this prisoner's dilemma that if you don't take special money, but then your opponent will take special mm -hmm. money. Or you know there will be the NRA running against you if you want to run a background check bill. The, the problem is, is that by having these super PACs, Citizens United has really screwed this up. And they're, the honest answer, mm -hmm. the not lying to you answer, is that not a lot's going to get done in the short term. We need to have legislatures with courage and a spine to do it. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Well, money in our politics is the biggest issue facing our democracy at this point. Um, as Mr. Valero said before me, the lobbyist issue is a huge problem because uh, as it currently stands, a lot of our legislative members have lobbyists working in their cabinets. Um, to take the money out of politics, I would like to obviously do the privately funded elections. So I'd like to pass a legislature in California to make sure that there's an incredibly low cap, whether it for, be for corporations or for individuals, that you can't donate over a specific amount of money. 
Um, right now, as Mr. Valero said earlier, we're allowing these people to police themselves. So, and they're in, afraid of getting primary, they're getting pushed out. So it's naturally human nature to kind of want to stay in power. So um, like he said, and I will reiterate that in the short term, I don't think anything is going to happen unless we have leaders who are not afraid to get out and knock the doors in the first place, talk to the public and uh, force all of the other legislative members back into the public as well to atone for what they've done in the first place. Um, currently right now I've knocked over 3,500 doors and I will tell you that there are a lot of disenfranchised voters in the state of California, or at least the people that I've talked to in this specific district, and they all want money out of politics. So I think it's time to elect leaders who are going to actually pass legislation to make a difference in the state. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Well, I think once again, we have to back up a little bit and take a, a look at what the real problem is. And I believe that the real problem is, is a lack of integrity in our leaders. Uh, we have people that are getting elected to office and the first thing they want is money. Um, I was up in Sacramento about a month ago and ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you've ever gone or walk through the halls the, of, of the uh, legislature there, but there are lobbyists and more lobbyists <laughs> and more lobbyists. And you go into the offices, there are more lobbyists in there. <laughs> they are all over. It was like a beehive. So I believe that what we need to do is we need to have people that are in office, who have integrity. We are, we are in a spiritual crisis in our nation. We have a moral deficit among our leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there are a couple of questions about charter schools and the fact that charter schools uh, are siphoning away children from public schools in some areas and that the corporations are tr trying to make inroads into the uh, public school districts. Do you, what is your uh, attitude toward uh, charter schools and the proliferation of charter schools in the region? And we'll begin with um, Ms. Martinez, go to Mr. Valero, and end with Mr. Carter. Some of you are not going to like my answer. And that's all right. Um, but I, I believe in common sense. And as a parent, I am a parent. As a parent, you want what is best for your child. And if homeschooling is best for your child, then so be it. If a charter school is best for your child, then so be it. If the public school is best for your child, then choose that. But we need to have choice for parents. Parents need to be involved in their children's education and we need to be able to have the, okay, you're paying your tax dollars. They're supporting our public schools, public schools that are failing. California public schools are at, I believe it's 49th in the nation in, in the standings which is shameful. We keep shoveling money into the public school system. With what result? With what result? I'll leave you there. Thank you. Mr. Valero. You know, having private schools that are pri privately funded is fine. The problem is having private schools that want to play public schools and siphon money away from our schools. The issue is, is that public schools, by having charter schools siphon money away for other programs that they would like to try, what that creates is schools that have resources and have not. And what you do is you create this land of misfit toys for schools because now you have children who are uh, either developmentally or physically disabled who do not have the same opportunities and charter schools will deny them that right to an education all the fancy uh, all the all the fancy curriculum in the world i'm a teacher this is what i do for a living and the thing is is that what charter schools do is appalling to siphoning out public education and Quite frankly, we the only people that really benefit from this charter school and private school nonsense is people like Pearson, McGraw-Hill, uh, 
these private education companies that then take away from what our children, the children that don't have a choice. School choice is only great if you have the actual opportunity to do it, but the children who don't have a choice, they're the ones that get left out. And they're the ones that we have to start worrying about. And I'm the one who has to start, including the rest of my profession, have to start dealing with the choices that people make because they want to have a choice when those children do not. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter. It is uh, no lie that charter schools are f uh, siphoning money out of our public education system. So uh, right now, I would like to propose or I would like to propose a revamp to the education system in the first place. I think public schools are failing for one reason, that they're not as effective as they should be. And that's why charter schools are becoming increasingly uh, more attractive, I guess you could say, in the state of California. Um, what I would propose is that the first couple years of school, we would adopt the Japanese and um, the Japanese system per se, or like the first couple years, I would say anywhere from kindergarten to first grade, you would just learn manners, Civ <laughs> <laughs> manners, civility, treating each other with respect. I agree. These are things that our youth are lacking, and especially in the inner cities, um, it's incredibly difficult to to get out of the inner cities. So what I would like to do is propose a revamp to the education system in the first place. And we should all learn the same things at the same age. And then after that, we can um, employ multiple teachers in classrooms from middle school through high school. And there's not a lot of time to answer this question, and it's pretty deep. So um, that's what I will say for now. But yes, charter schools are siphoning money away from public schools. And uh, it's providing the wealthy and people that can afford it with the opportunity as opposed to people who want the opportunity but can't get it. So. Agreed. It sounds like all, we all have pretty different views on education, so I'd, you know, I think we'd all like another education yeah. one if that's the case. Well, I have another question about education. <laughs> <laughs> what is your platform on improving the quality of education in the K through 12 system and local higher education? And we will begin with Mr. Carter, go to Ms. Martinez, and end with Mr. Valero. <laughs> Well, as I said before, I think there needs to be a complete overhaul to the public education system. I think we should look at what other countries have done, and we should model them, especially because they're the front runners. Um, you know, like I said before, kindergarten through first grade, I think you should just learn manners, civility, things like that. Learning how to take care of, uh, take out the trash, clean up after yourself. I know this is, sounds absurd to some people, but I don't think it really is. Um, after that, we can extend the school year through elementary school. Uh, to make up for that lost time with curriculum. And uh, we can have two teachers in the classroom from middle school until high school. So if a teacher can't make it to class or they're um, on administrative leave or they're on maternity leave, one of these teachers can pay attention to the classroom and the other teacher can teach and they can also grade papers. Um, I think right now it's not, even, it's not even an issue of paying teachers more. I think they're just overburdened. If there's 40 students in a class, there's no way that you can control 40 teenagers. I know I can't. No one can. And, you know, if you miss class one day, these kids aren't learning. So we have to have, a, we have, to have the system change where there should be at least two teachers in classrooms, and they can teach the same curriculum. If one's gone, the other one can pick up right where they left off. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Uh, I want to go back to the charter school because uh, question. I, I do not want to pretend to be a proponent again of charter schools or the fact that they're sucking the money out of our public school education. What I do believe is, as Mr. Valero uh, basically said, is that, and, and also Mr. Uh, uh, Carter, is that we need to revamp our educational system. We have to refocus what we are doing in public education. For one thing, we are spending so much uh, time and focus on things that do not uh, affect all of the children uh, with regards to learning. We are spending too much focus on social uh, conditions, uh, social questions, and not enough on math, reading, literature, English, those skills that they will take into the future. We have gotten too far away from um, the, uh, well, basic. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Help from the audience. <laughs> 
Thank you. Okay, Mr. Valero. Um, as someone who sees a classroom as of as early as this morning, um, mm. the issue, to be quite frank, is that we have an obsession with standardized tests. Um, we have an obsession with metrics and measuring, and the thing is, quite frankly, running for the assembly, I think quite, uh, local school boards should have more decisions on what works for their kids, period. You want school choice, Ms. Martinez? The thing is, is that the school choice that should be happening is parents and school boards and PTAs having a decision over the curriculum that they want, as opposed to a curriculum that the state is dictating as a one-size-fits-all approach, and that is not working. You wanna know why schools are failing? It's because we have arbitrary goals that kids need to get to. You know, the fact is that, that even in high school, we have counselors from 700 to one. 700 to one for your children to figure out what are, whether or not they want to go do some, what they want to do with their lives. We have higher education that treats community colleges and vocational schools like they're a second class education. We don't talk to our children about the dignity of work when it comes to welding or air conditioning or being a mechanic. My generation wasn't spoken to that way and we need to change the way because I see kids at Rio Hondo and or Citrus and they'll go, I'm going to Rio Hondo or Citrus. They're ashamed of it and we need to change that because that didn't used to happen. We used to have respect for community colleges and for our state schools. Mm -hmm. So we need to, ch that's what change we need to have in the state, in, in our education system today. And one thing from his point is that um, Albert Einstein said that if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will grow up its entire life thinking it's stupid. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Thank we need you to, other people. Thank you for that pearl yes, of exactly. wisdom. <laughs> 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 You're welcome. All right, cheers to that one. There we go. I am actually sort of startled that we have used up our hour. Are you serious? <laughs> the second half was the best, right? <laughs> More entertaining anyway. So we unfortunately, because people I think are, are really gaining something from this discussion, um, need to move to closing remarks oh. and end, end this so people can go home and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are some of you who, are, who yes. have to be up at five to get off somewhere. <laughs> so our closing remarks will be um, in reverse order of the opening remarks. We, and we will begin with Justin Joshua Valero. It's two minutes, right? Too. Okay, cool. <laughs> it, it, it's what it said on the program. So, again, okay. my name is Justin Valero, and I told you before, I want to change the way California does politics, but not in the way that you're thinking. We need to start going back to basics. That's how politics has kind of left us all. We, we really are interested in lofty ideals about changing the world or changing the planet and changing the state but the thing is is that we we've lost sight of our backyard we've lost sight of our neighborhoods and we don't talk about making sure that you know kids can get enough cow grants to be a mechanic we don't talk about whether or not my neighbor on medi-cal can go to pih because of the fact that they don't cover her. so she's got to go take uh so she's got to go dead to Downey and take a bus to go get glycoma checked out. We don't talk about uh, the, the basic issues of property crime in, this, in our, our city has gone up by 60%. We've had experiments with if Prop 57, 47, AB 109 that haven't worked and have actually ended up with a police officer shot and dead in our streets and people being vandalized, people being burgled, and it's, I mean, let me ask you, do you feel any safer than you do a couple years ago? Think, I mean, ask yourself that realistically. Do you feel more economically safe than you did a couple of years ago? Do your kids feel more economically safe? I'm 28 years old, and it's my generation, I think Blake's about my age too, okay. so, and we're the first generation that is going to be worse off than our parents were in, in mm -hmm. decades. And that's going to be because of the fact that we took our eye off the ball on major issues. So I'm worried about your kids. I'm worried about making sure, I'm making sure that you have 
the right tools to have the type of economic opportunity to make sure that you have housing opportunities, to make sure that we're not going bankrupt because we may have the crime of getting sick, to make sure that a senior can live their life, their, their retirement years with dignity. Those are the basics that we need to get back to. And it shocks me that that is changing California politics, but it is. And that's why I need your vote on June 5th. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it is time to hear from Blake Sullivan Carter. Um, I'm doing this and I'm thrusting myself into this extraordinary situation, I guess you could say, because I'm a concerned citizen. Um, I've seen the gradual erosion of, um, of California's republic over time. When I was a kid, things were a little bit different than they are now. And as Justin Valero said, um, my generation is the first generation that's not going to live as long as a parent. Um, it's hard to get an education in this state. It's hard um, to get funding for anything for your dreams. Right now, currently, we don't have a healthcare system in this state that's viable enough. So let's say if you want to run a small business, it's going to be very difficult for you to make that transition because you're too afraid to leave your job that gives you the benefits. We're not encouraging entrepreneurship. We're not encourage, encouraging free thinkers. We're definitely not supporting people going to vocational schools and getting grants so they can become mechanics and have a, I mean, right now I know it's over $50 an hour to hire a plumber in the state of California because there are none. And that's good for plumbers. My grandfather was a plumber, supply and demand, but still um, we need to encourage people. Um, well, we need to give people the opportunity in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have the opportunity, they can't do anything. So what I would like to do if I was elected is I would like to, revisit all of these things and try and give people the opportunities. Yes, I do have a D by my name and I am a Democrat, but I'm a fiscally conservative Democrat who doesn't, who doesn't believe in government waste and I am bipartisan. So right now we have a two party system in the state of California and in the nation. And if you're not a Democrat or you're not a Republican, you're against one another. There's no need for something like that. We can work together despite if you have a D or an R next to your name. And I hope that I can bridge that gap. So I'm here as a member of my generation to start bridging that gap. And it might be very difficult to do, but I can see the fire in Mr. Valero's eyes as well, is that he wants the same thing. So although we are very young, I don't think we lack any life experience. And I think we can lead the state, or particularly me, because I want to talk about myself. <laughs> I think that we can lead this state uh, into a better place, but we have to take money out of politics and we have to be able to provide a safety net for the people here without wasting taxpayer dollars. So vote for me. You won't, uh, you won't regret it. Thank you. <laughs> here, here. And finally, we will hear from Jessica Martinez. Yes. Well, I know this, is, this has been a fun uh, hour, hasn't it? <laughs> I'm sure everybody is sorry that they left when they did, right? Because the best is yet to come. Anyway, uh, it, just, it just happened. So in any case, um, we all want the American dream. We want the California dream. These two young men here are basically talking about how uh, their generation is not going to see the same type of prosperity that their parents did. And it's a shame. How did this all happen? Well, we have to look at the policies that our California state legislature has been following, which is spend, 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 uh, bring uh, immigrants, illegal immigrants, into the country, spend, spend, spend on their education, uh, their medical, uh, their housing, and so many other things. Um, we are spending money that we do not have. We should be spending money on our veterans. We should be spending on American citizens' children. Um, I, my son has two friends that wanted to go to, to different UC schools, and guess what? They couldn't because their parents work, and their parents work enough to, to provide for their family, but not enough to pay these you know, huge amounts of tuition uh, that these UC schools ask for. Um, so let me say this. We want our American dream back for our young people. We need to bring businesses back to California that will provide great jobs for Californians as a whole. So in any case, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for having us. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
Thank you. I second that. Thank you. Well, that was a lot more fun than the other one. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for being here and for sharing your ideas with us and with the audience both here and at home. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming and uh, staying till the wee hours of the, of the night and the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women for helping make this event possible and the City of Whittier for providing us the venue and taping it for us. There will, this will be replayed many times on local Whittier cable between now and the election. And John will also be putting the tapes of these two uh, forums up on YouTube so that those of you who are into watching things on your computer will have the opportunity to see the event in the future. And it will also open it up to people who are not living in the immediate neighborhood but are within this district. So thank you very much. Uh, there are five ballot measures on the ballot, and there are pamphlets outside that you may want to take home that have pro and con arguments and a little explanation of each measure in them. Um, all of you are welcome to become members of the League of Women Voters, and there are membership folders outside. So think seriously about that, because we would welcome your input. And good night. <laughs>